Hey, it's Andrew, and today on the show we have Emmanuel Strashnov, co-founder and co-CEO of Bubble. In this episode, we talked about the rise of no-code tools popularity, why Bubble decided to raise funding, and the challenges they face with churn due to the nature of their product. We also dived into the challenges Bubble faced when designing their customer onboarding, how their pricing strategy has evolved over the years, and why Emmanuel believes that qualitative insights are more valuable than quantitative analysis. As usual, I'm excited to hear what you think of this episode, and if you have any feedback, I would love to hear from you. You can email me directly on andrew at churn.fm. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, and enjoy the episode. You don't just gun for revenue in the door. This is Churn.fm, the podcast for subscription economy pros. Each week, we hear how the world's fastest growing companies are tackling churn and using retention to fuel their growth. How do you build a habit forming product? We crossed over that magic threshold to negative churn. You need to invest in customer success. It always comes down to, to retention and engagement. Completely bootstrap, profitable, and growing. Strategies, tactics, and ideas brought together to help your business thrive in the subscription economy. I'm your host, Andrew Michael. And here's today's episode. Hey, Manuel, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. It's excellent. Uh, today's an exciting episode. And uh, for the listeners, Emmanuel is the founder and co-CEO of Bubble, a visual programming language for web and mobile application whose goal is to make code obsolete. Emmanuel was born in Paris. He studied computer science and mathematics at École Polytechnique and received his MBA from Harvard Business School. After seven years as a bootstrap startup and more than a quarter of a million users, Bubble raised six million in its first round of funding in June last year. So my first question for you, Emmanuel, is why is now the time for no-code? I think there is a combination of two things that happen. The first thing is there is a lot of skepticism around the no-code idea. I mean, now no-code is hot and so people are less skeptical, but over the last 30 years, a lot of engineers would always say, oh yeah, visual programming will never get anywhere. You can't do what you want with it. And so it took quite some time for tools to get good enough for people to start being excited again. So we started Bubble in 2012, and I think it's in 2016, 2018 that people started being excited about no code. And at that time, our product, for instance, was much more powerful and could actually start delivering the promise that no code is about, you know, like letting people do the same thing with, without code that they would do with code. So that's one thing. And I think the second thing that also had a pretty important impact is if you remember the early years of the decade, the past decade, like 2010, 2012, 2014, it was all about learning how to code. Like, you know, a lot of boot camps, you know, Code Academy was extremely hot in New York. And I think governments were investing a lot. Uh, Code.org was, you know, um, generating a lot of noise. And I, I think people, sadly almost, I want to say, people have realized that after a few years, it's not that simple to teach everyone how to code. Coding is still, and I can say that because I'm a coder myself, a fairly tedious task that is not for everyone. It requires a certain type of personality. And so people got burned a little bit by the idea that everyone would would learn how to code. And so the combination of these two things led to no code being in its prime time today, I think. Yeah, I I definitely echo the point in terms of like uh, turning down the idea of these visual coding uh, software because uh, recently I was one of those uh, people that shunned on it until like a couple of months ago, I decided to redo the podcast website actually, which you're going to be launching on the year's anniversary. Uh, I built it in Webflow, which is not nearly as advanced as what you do at Bubble yet, but I was just blown away and I felt like I had been living under a rock to see like how powerful these no code tools had become. And then today I was playing around as well with Bubble and just seeing how quick and easy you can sort of be able to like pull in different aspects, different tools. Uh, I think your onboarding process, you even show a way where you can create a mini app in the sense that you can search for a location on a map, you can save it to a database, and then you can visualize and show those uh, locations on the map. And I think that's in the past, uh, could have taken you a few hours to get right. It was in a matter of minutes up and running and uh, with bubbles. I definitely yeah. have changed it, it, my skepticism. <laughs> well, I'm glad. And this is actually like um, what you just said about, you know, the minutes versus the number of hours is uh, to me the actual value of no code. Like the value of no code is not necessarily that it doesn't involve code so more people can do it. I mean, it is true, but more importantly, it's probably 50 times to 100 times faster. 
And that is extremely valuable for everyone, including coders, you know. So it's actually changing a lot how the business world works. So far, software development is always a bottleneck of business, you know, whether it's startups or big companies. And no code is actually a very good way to fix that. Yeah. And, and I definitely think like a lot of them are disguised in a lot of ways. There's no code startups. So obviously Zapier one is, is a famous example, but I think like other examples that just came to mind after you said this now was something like segment where in the past you would have had required like data engineers to do a lot of the work between piping different tools together, similar to where Zapier works, where now you just flick a switch, you add a few details, and then you have an integration flowing into your data warehouse. It's just incredible like how little effort you need to do now to be able to create powerful applications and have a powerful data store. So definitely time is one of those big, big, big pluses for no code. Yep. So why uh, raising funding now? So you've been building uh, Bubble now for over seven years. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, over a quarter million users that might have even increased a lot by since then, since the funding announcement. But what was the motivation to go out and sort of raise this round of funding now? What are you trying to do uh, in this next year, two years? So I guess the, the more important question here is more, why didn't we raise money earlier? Because that's actually what was more unique, like raising yeah. money is yeah. actually more straightforward. So the reason why we didn't raise is we felt, so I think the time of no code was not there. We just talked about this. And uh, again, the level of skepticism is fairly high in terms of product. And so what we decided was uh, let's actually focus on the product first not try to get too many users and get to a position where we could tell people without misleading them, without lying, to be frank, oh, hey, you can deal Twitter or Airbnb on Bubble. And a lot of people make that promise, but they actually don't necessarily deliver on it. And we truly do. Like you could literally clone Twitter on Bubble today, but it took us something like, you know, five years to get there. And so we felt that fundraising too soon would put some pressure in terms of timing that would not be healthy to reach that goal. And so the reason why we raise money afterwards is because we actually reached that goal. And then we had to hit the opportunity as hard as we could. And even though we were profitable and, you know, generating revenue, I think the opportunity ahead of us is too big for us just to do it from a, in a bootstrap uh, auto finance way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the power of no code is enormous and like the opportunity in front, it's, it's almost endless, I think. Uh, you also have some really good success stories I was reading through that you've had uh, companies use Bubble to get into Y Combinator, which I think was Plato. You had others that raised over 300 million and processed over a billion dollars of loans with Bubble Powered Platform uh, and others yep. that have just bootstrapped businesses to 30K MMR within six months. So some really, really exciting stuff coming out there. And I'm sure this is like something that must excite you quite a bit is seeing what people are building now with Bubble. What's been your biggest surprise that some, uh, something someone's built? Uh, um. Well, every application, honestly, uh, Bubble is so open-ended in the test sense that you can really put all the elements on the page however you want them. You can have as many as you want on the page, and then you can create those workflows saying, you know, when the user clicks on this button, do this, do this, do that, and have as many actions as you want. It's hard actually for us to sometimes predict what people are going to build. And sometimes what we see is uh, some, I, I, it happens to me that I look at an application and I have ways to see that it's built on Bubble looking at the console. And I'm like, how did they do that? I didn't know that was possible to do that on the platform. That is uh, the coolest thing. An example I have often is this guy that built an advent calendar for his girlfriend using our product. So not a business at all, not something that I thought someone would use Bubble for and turns out yeah. he used it. And that is, the, that is the best thing. In general, when you create open-ended tools that empower people to do things, that's usually what happens when people start using your tool in a way you didn't think about. To me, that's the best. Yeah, I can imagine just seeing all the different tools. And then I think, lucky you've got in some cases, at least in the early stage, you have the branding that you can still be able to see if they were made with Bubble or not. Because uh, like you said, there's some tools that are out there like MBMB, right. Twitter, Kickstarter, that can almost be cloned. And you wouldn't know that they were built with uh, Bubble. I've seen a few of these right. as well, other uh, networks now like Makerpad and uh, so forth that actually have tutorials of teaching you how to do these clones. And uh, obviously Bubble comes up in a lot of these tutorials to get it done. So one thing I'm interested about your business uh, and I mentioned it just before we got on the call as well was 
it feels to me, and maybe I'm making an assumption, that there's sort of this double-edged sword uh, when it comes to your product in the sense that you would probably typically attract quite a lot of young uh, startups, entrepreneurs wanting to get started, but they're never seeing it really through. So you see quite a lot of high churn due to the nature of small businesses or because the businesses fold themselves. And the said once people get to a certain stage of growth and then they potentially move platforms and start to build their own custom app. And is this the case? Like, how are you dealing with this at the moment uh, at Bubble? Right. So we do indeed have these kind of two churns, like at the uh, earlier in the life cycle of a customer when people just start a company uh, on us and the company doesn't work out which happens you know with most startups that that churn doesn't matter and does not worry me at all because what we've noticed is people churn and indeed go from paying to non-paying but they don't leave the platform they just they come back after a few months with another project so that does not is not a problem the churn where that is more like a graduation when companies do extremely well and so kind of migrating off the platform it used to be a huge problem for us two years ago. Today, honestly, I mean, it happens sometime, but the cost of recreating something from scratch with engineers when you have it built on Bubble and it's already generating revenue, uh, because if it's not gener- generating revenue, you won't be able to raise money or to fund you know, recreating the thing, is extremely high. And so that company, for instance, that has raised $300 million, they told us two years ago that they wanted, they've been acquired by another entity. And the other entity said, hey, you guys need to rebuild everything from scratch. And they actually started. And two years later, they're still using us because it's very, very hard to do. So we don't want to abuse that position. Again, it does happen, but we know what to do there and how to address that. And it's really just about making sure the platform scales better, is more reliable and more uh, faster at scale. And so we're just executing on this to keep them. What I would say that the market forces are very much in our advantage because uh, it's not because you make a lot of uh, have a lot of traffic that is going to be easy to hire good engineers. I mean, everybody is struggling struggling to good, get good engineers, and so in, effectively, it's much simpler to stay on bubble. The last thing that we've noticed is uh, the, for this case of this company, for instance, uh, that raised these three hundred million dollars. So they have a team rebuilding everything, but at the same time, they, they also have their bubble developers improving the platform because they get continuous feedback. And so it's a race, you know, between uh, the engineers and the bubble team and uh, like the bubble team as, you know, on their side, not our side. And uh, the team working on bubble actually evolves the product faster and it takes a very long time for them to, um, so I, I'm not even sure whether they will catch up. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think the switching costs just, uh, the bigger you get, I think the more they grow. And the more powerful your platform becomes, the harder it gets to sort of keep up with that uh, change. Yeah. What, what, one thing I'll say about the, I, I think the low end churn investors, because investors are really the one that care a lot about churn and they should. I think churn on the low end, if you look at companies like Shopify and Stripe, they have enormous churn if you look in percentage, you know, because most people that start something on Shopify don't sell anything after a couple of months and they shut down, right? Most developers that integrate with the Stripe API, I don't know the numbers, but my guess is that many, many of them never charge more than a hundred dollars. It's, but because of those very successful companies with this kind of churn, investors have understood that if you are in the long tail, it is normal to have high churn and it's okay. Absolutely. And specifically when you're dealing with SMB space, uh, it's, it's absolutely normal to have. Shana, I think exactly. it's, it's worrying uh, if SMB you don't have a percentage of your customers. Yeah, SMB or subs. It's worrying though when you don't have a good percentage of your customers uh, where the churn rate flattens out. But definitely you can understand sort of in the long tail and the low end of the market, uh, early stage startups as well, it is high risk uh, games. So, for sure. Yep. Uh, so, that's sort of one of the, the challenges that you're trying to tackle and it sounds sort of definitely like you've got a good grasp on it and uh, as the platform becomes more powerful, sort of that graduation moment will be coming less and less uh, for you. What are some of the other challenges that you're facing when it comes to tuner retention? I, I mentioned earlier, I tried out and signed up for Bubble myself and I started going through the onboarding. It seems like you guys must have gone through a few iterations of that as well to get to where it is today, trying to sort of show the value and the power of it. Because it is, at the end of the day, it's a simple tool, but it's still a complex tool. So what are some of the other challenges you've been facing? I I mean, it is that one, the one you just mentioned, like onboarding and making sure people go through the learning curve that is real. I think it's about, you know, five to 10 hours, depending on how tech savvy you are. 
but it is a real investment we're asking our users to make. And that's where we're losing most people. So that, that is not even churn because users haven't started paying yet. You know, they're still in the discovery period. But that's where we actually have like a significant drop between people that sign up and people that actually start building an application on us. Um, the way we solve that, I mean, I think it's a combination of three things. One is improve the user interface and making it a little bit, well, firstly, uh, a little bit better design. I mean, what we have is a little bit old school and then a little bit more user-friendly for some aspects. So that's one path, which is more of an engineering slash design path. Then there is another thing, which is a better documentation. So we're actually hiring right now someone to write a bubble curriculum to hold your hand a little bit better than those lessons that we have that are valuable to show you that you can do something, but not necessarily to hold your hand um, along those five to 10 hours. And the last thing, to be honest, it's a little bit of a communication problem. Like if, if we had, you know, like household name companies started on us and people would know them and then we tell them, well, you, you know, they were started on us. Bubble. By the way, if you spend 10 hours on Bubble, you'll be able to do the same thing without engineers. I think that will solve all our onboarding problems because people will just stick to us. Um, because at the end of the day, if you compare 10 hours to like some other tools that might seem long, but if you compare 10 hours to you know learning how to code, it's like 1%, you know, it's like tiny. And so we're playing on those three things at the same time. Um, to uh, betting in our best users to get those success stories and improve our communication, improve our design and improve our documentation to get to a point where we don't have this drop off. Yeah. And, and like you said, so a lot of it's not even churn yet because it's really people just testing out the platform. I think as well, because you have a free trial or you have a free version, actually, you also do get a lot of users just coming in and just browsing, just checking out what is this and never really intended to build anything to begin with. So, and it definitely sounds like you've got sort of the three pillars where you focus, they make a lot of sense. I think the communication is definitely, the probably as an industry, like as a, there's still this sort of misconception, just like I had personally, like a couple of months ago until I started playing around with the tools again, is that you felt that they weren't up to scratch or they could never do what code could do. I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges. And how are you like approaching this now, this new education, trying to communicate the value of no code? Are you working in collaboration with any other of the no code startups to sort of try and uh, show the power of it? Yeah, well, we work with uh, Makerpad that you mentioned a little bit earlier, who's, uh, who's big on education. So it's a very good fit. And then, yeah, it, it is a joint effort. And I'm actually... Might sound surprising, but I'm actually glad the space is getting more crowded than before because for the first five years, it was really just us and Webflow to some extent, but Webflow at that time was not really no code. It was more like uh, a tool for designers, you know, that would generate CSS and HTML uh, code. And so it was a little bit difficult to evangelize. So today, you know, we're partnering with um, Parabola in San Francisco that does something a little bit different from us, but we integrated our two products to make it easier. We're working on an Airtable integration, all those things to basically join forces with all the no-code tools so that, you know, people understand that you can actually do, um, you can actually do real things. Uh, because at the end of the day, I don't see ourselves us as competitors. The no-code space is hot today, but it's very small compared to what it could be. My, my personal goal is that in five years, we don't talk about no code anymore. Um, you know, no code just becomes, you know, the way to build it's things standard. and yeah. it's a standard and it's not no code, it's just a way to build things. And sometimes you go to code because you want to go low level, but uh, uh, it's actually not frequent. And, and so, and to do that, because of that, I don't think we're competing. In fact, you know, the pie is going to get bigger, bigger and bigger. And uh, we all, we have a fair share in it. Yeah, I absolutely see that. It definitely like it feels like there's no end in sight for where this can go. And like I think uh, listening to one of your previous podcasts, I think it was Jason Galcanis, in terms of like how this enables a, a new set of coders, a new set of entrepreneurs, like who were previously sort of not able to go out and create and build what they wanted. Uh, it'll be exciting to see some of the new things that people come up with and are able to actually produce now. 
But I still think there is this challenge in the sense that engineers themselves have a very specific way of thinking and being able to architect an app and be able to understand how an app is going to work is also not as simple as you think. You can have a visual interface, you can make it really easy, but being able to put all the pieces together in a coherent way that actually produces results at the end is also another challenge. And it's part of probably what you learn in coding schools themselves as well. How are you thinking about this challenge and what are some of the things that you, you want to be helping with uh, your customers when it comes to the training? So there are a couple of things here. First of all, actually, yes, you, if you use Bubble, you need to know how to think about you know, your data structure. You need to know, uh, okay, if I want to create an Airbnb type marketplace, how am I going to describe the thing that is for rent? So the apartment, you know, an address, some features, uh, a review is going to have a title, a rating, which is a number, and then a, co a content, for instance, a text. Honestly, a lot of people can do this without a technical training after a little bit of thinking. And today, yes, today you would learn that in coding schools because people think that, you know, to apply these principles, you need to be coding. But tools like Bubble actually create opportunities for people to think about this without getting the hand of the code, which is a much more efficient way. And so what we've seen in practice is that even without like a ton of training, people might make a few mistakes at first, but because no, Bubble gives you like a very fast feedback loop when you build things, you will realize pretty quickly, oh shit, this data structure is actually not very handy because of this, this, and that, and then they fix it. So there is quite some hope there. Now, we try to do things ourselves on our side to make it a little bit easier, which is, you know, well, better documentation, a debugger. Uh, one of the very important features we have is the fact that uh, we have a debugger to go to your workflows like step by step because again bubble is very open-ended and because it's open-ended you can do bugs basically like you can make mistakes in your logic and so there are ways for us to we, we find ways to help users help themselves my philosophy here is create the tools instead of you know restricting what people can do to prevent them from making mistakes create the tools to help them figure out their mistakes themselves and if you do that they're very happy because they're at first they're struggling but then they figure it out and people love that feeling which i think is a, it's a little bit the feeling that people have at school you know when they're kids and they don't understand something and then finally they understand it and they're actually happy everybody even people that don't enjoy school enjoy that feeling because it's something that was hard that becomes easy yeah, um, that moment. Yeah. right exactly that that moment and so that, that's a better way and that's also a much more scalable way because it, again if you create an open-ended tool it's very hard to cover all the use cases but if you create something that helps people think themselves uh, and find their mistakes and iterate on them, then they can do anything. Absolutely. Uh, and you mentioned something earlier as well uh, that got my attention now. I want to just dive into a little bit deeper. You, the concept of sort of the long tail and have these uh, early stage startups starting, using it for projects, then coming back and then starting again. How did you sort of figure this out that this was happening and that you were seeing this regularly? Are they keeping the same accounts and just downgrading and then restarting again? And how do you think about this then in the context of churn? How are you measuring for this? Yeah, I mean, they were using exactly the same account. And especially in the early years, you know, where we didn't have that many customers, we would see the same names coming back in our success, like uh, help desk uh, software, the same names and people will, would come with new applications. Um, so that's how we found out. We really have people that leave us because they hate us, especially in the early days, because we, again, that's one of the advantages of not raising money too soon. We could actually spend a lot of time uh, with customers. So for, believe it or not, but for the first two years, I think I was personally, because I was building the product, but also doing like uh, customer success, I was on Skype or Hangout at that time probably like an hour a day with users just to make sure to discuss about what they were doing and help them find features that they couldn't figure out how to use. And so people were very faithful for that. And so they would stick around. Today, we can't do that anymore as much. I mean, we do phone consultations, but obviously it doesn't work uh, the same. But now we have this community on the forum where people keep helping each other. And so that's also a way to keep them. And sorry, your second question was? And the thing was sort of like, how are you measuring this as well? How are you dealing with this in the context of churn? Uh, so I think earlier you mentioned in some cases you don't even consider a churn because it's something you can do with, but how are you keeping track of it? Like, is it a metric you keep an eye on? Not too much, actually, because uh, we still like a SaaS businesses that is MR driven. And so um, at the end of the day, the number I track more is like the net revenue churn. Um, it's something we haven't started optimizing too much on. Like, um, 
we know they come back. We haven't started optimizing too much on uh, how many people come back because I think at our stage, it's important to go for like, you know, one specific goal and really focus hard on it. And in our case, uh, we want to work on revenue currently. And so we look at net revenue churn instead. So I'm glad that people come back, but it's not something I try to optimize on. Yeah, so then the, you'd say majority of the growth in net revenue is coming from new business as opposed to reactivation. Yes, and expansion. Expansion is actually really big for us. Okay. Because that, that's, a little, that's a little bit the nature of our business. Uh, you know, people start companies on us, they grow, and then they start paying more. So okay. we're, very for, we, we're very fortunate uh, to be very transparent over the last 13 months. I think we only had one month with a positive net revenue churn. All the oh, other months were negative. negative. So that's we're pretty lucky. Yep, definitely. And I think it's, it's when you get sort of your pricing and product right, like that's a great result. I think like this comes up in the podcast quite a lot. And specifically when we talk about like net negative uh, churn, and like it's always the companies that have this really strong alignment to as their customers become more successful, they become more successful. Yep. Your pricing strategy in the beginning, you've been going for seven years now, like how has that evolved? Like what have you learned about it over the years? Uh, has it changed at all or did you just get it right from day one? Um, this is a very hard question. Actually, I can talk about that for a very long time. Uh, I'm not sure we have completely nailed our pricing so far. I think that we might, be, we might need ways to refine it. The main challenge that we have is twofold. We know the pricing that segments well users because we have you know people in high school just literally just playing or maybe starting a side project but not for home you know like you know fifteen dollars a month is really high and then we have companies that raise three hundred million dollars uh, running on us and so we these businesses honestly we undercharge them we could be charging them much more and so you need to find a pricing uh, scheme that works for both so that's one challenge that we have and the second challenge that we have is that because we mostly target non-technical people. Non-technical people are not necessarily aware of all the technical resources that it takes to be to run an application. And yeah. uh, especially the fact that price comes at with scale is not necessarily something obvious. So to give you an example of what we ended up doing, what we were doing in the early years uh, of Bubble. So in Bubble, you can run workflows, right? A workflow, you know, when a button is clicked, signs a user up, send, uh, charge a credit card, send an email, change the page, for instance. And so we used to charge people per workflow run, whenever a workflow would run, and each plan would have an allocation of workflow runs. And so we, st- we had two problems with that. That is, first of all, we had a lot of people telling us, uh, emailing us, say, I'm building this business, but I'm envisioning so much activity on my side that this is going to be too expensive, so I can't use you guys. So that's, it's, um, I mean, it's not necessarily a realistic concern, but you know, this, when people email you that, you have to create something that doesn't lead to that question, otherwise, you know, it's a huge stop in terms of adoption. Yeah. And the second problem we're having is that some people started optimizing the workflows to reduce the number of workflow runs, but leading to less efficient designs. Because again, Bubble is really open-ended, and so you can design your application in a smart way. And so that was uh, not optimal. And so we iterated um, a little bit from this, ended going to a system that we think is um, much more efficient today, where basically we don't have limits in workflow runs or like usage on the application, but your application by default gets a certain share of CPU time compared to all the other applications. And so if your application starts having a lot of traffic, you're going to be waiting a little bit. Uh, And so it becomes a little bit slower. And so you can pay for faster performance. What we've noticed is that people are more willing to pay for performance than to pay for usage. Now, as our users, user base becomes more sophisticated around the concept of scaling and everything, we might be coming back at some point to usage because it's actually a more natural way to price things but it's something we'd see over time yeah it's interesting that you're experimenting quite a bit uh, similarly i think a lot of sort of the metrics companies like mix panel kiss metrics a few others at the time they all used to in the previous they used to charge by event and then they quickly realized like that was restricting their customers from building the event architecture and being able to track what they wanted and i think in the end like a lot of them now have really turned back to just users like uh, monthly right. tracked users and not just all users, like so it became really about usage as opposed to sort of like a, a, an arbitrary metric 
uh, that maybe had some correlation with the tool, but wasn't really with the value that the customer is receiving. I do see like a, in terms of performance being definitely one of those aspects. I think it might not be as straightforward and clear for people to understand though, like you say, if you're non-technical, even from that perspective, that you need to pay for extra performance because you, you might in some ways also think that isn't Bubble like a really highly performant tool that I should be using and not worrying about performance. So I can see yep. you have a, have a tricky job ahead of you over the next few years experimenting around pricing and packaging. But, you know, it's, uh, we also have the freedom of, you know, experimenting. I mean, uh, especially yep. we're dealing with most, most people on the monthly plan, so we can do different cohorts. We usually grandfather people when we make some changes, so it's pretty easy to test and see what sticks. Absolutely. I, I can't remember who said this on the show, but like pricing and packaging is a part of your product. It's not something that should be treated separately. And just like you run experiments and you change your product, you can change pricing and packaging. And like you said, if you've got good controls in place and you can have grandfathering procedures that keep your existing customers happy while allowing you to experiment, it's the best place to be. Exactly. So, so one question I want to ask you, Emmanuel, that I ask everybody that joins the, the show is, let's imagine a hypothetical scenario now that... Uh, you've joined a new company and uh, churn retention is not doing well at this company. And the CEO at this company has come to you and said, Emmanuel, I want you to turn things around for us. Uh, we have three months to see some results. What would be some of the first things you want to do in those 90 days to turn things around for the company? Well, first of all, interview users actually believe in qualitative uh, insights more than quantitative insights. Back to you, what I was saying in the early years of the company, where we'd spend like an hour on the phone uh, with users. I think you can learn much more there. So just, you know, pick randomly five out of the 15 first people that churn when you stop taking the job and figure out, talk to them. Hopefully they would answer uh, your email uh, and have a call with them to figure out what's uh, breaking. And based on that, uh, make the changes. My my guess is that for most most problems uh, it's more of a product issue than a business issue like sometimes you know might say you know if you change your pricing or something like this i would reduce it but i doubt it at the end of the day especially in the early days it's all about the product yeah it's and uh, like you said definitely this is something that's repeated over and over and over and over again on the show sort of like speak to your customers and more so during the early days because the data itself can only tell you so much like uh, jumping on a call will take you uh, a month or two ahead just speaking to customers and actually hearing their pain points because at the early days as well the data has got mixed signals you don't have maybe the numbers as well to get informed decisions and at the end of the day you're building for people not for numbers before we wrap up like i'm interested to hear sort of uh, your view of the future now and where you see sort of bubble going over the next five years and the no code industry as a whole what's exciting things uh, are coming up? what can we be building well, a lot of things. I think um, for for us, we're pushing very hard on you know performance, reliability, and scale to have bigger and bigger users uh, using us at some point moving into enterprise because there is a real need there. As a whole, our goal as a company is you know within one to two years uh, be, become basically the default place when people go to start web-based companies. Like if someone wants to start a web-based startup, maybe they will end up coding because if found that you know for what they're do, doing coding might be more efficient uh, but 90 percent of the case i want them to stick on bubble and i want to be that default place where that happens uh, because once we have there you know a lot of the emerging technologies that are been greatly today started with the startup space i think it's a very uh, promising strategy in the long run uh, again as i was saying earlier i want in five years i hope no code does not exist anymore and instead it's just everything is no code except for a few specialists that will be writing code similarly to today some people would be writing assembly language if they want to take full control of the device but most people don't do this our goal here is just to become the new standards a new layer on top of you know html css javascript objective c swift or uh, java for android and not to be a concept anymore but just be the new standard for programming that's amazing and i can definitely see it happening as well just looking at where you are today and where you've come from so I wish you best of luck on that. Is there anything you'd like Thank to you. leave us with? Any final thoughts? Uh, how can uh, the audience keep up to speed with what you're building? What they, should they be well, doing if they think about I mean, building their next startup? I mean, I'm gonna say it's gonna sound bad, but I would tell people honestly, give it a try. Like, give it a try to Bubble because it's actually free, uh, and it's, it will be free forever until you need your own do domain name. So there's really no cost to try. Bear with us in the early days of your 
experience with Bubble because there is a learning curve. But believe me, if you have doubt, go to the forum and ask, should I spend 10 hours to learn this? And people will answer what they think. You, you, once you go through that learning curve, you have superpowers. And so what that means is that for people that are listening that want to start companies and that think, oh, I can't start this company because I don't have engineers, this is not true anymore. You have no excuse, so just go for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's millions of people out there that uh, have these ideas, want to get started, but just didn't have the engineering skills. So as you said, Bubble is now a superpower and it's up to you to take it on or not. Exactly. Well, Emmanuel, it was a pleasure having you on the show today and uh, looking forward to see what you come up over the next uh, one to two years and if your vision becomes a reality in the next five. Thank you very much. It was a great chatting with you. Thanks. And that's a wrap for the show today with me, Andrew Michael. I really hope you enjoyed it and you're able to pull out something valuable for your business. To keep up to date with Churn.fm and be notified about new episodes, blog posts, and more, subscribe to our mailing list by visiting churn.fm. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have any feedback, good or bad, I would love to hear from you. And you can provide your blunt, direct feedback by sending it to andrew at churn.fm. Lastly, but most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it and leave a review as it really helps get the word out and grow the community. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.